I'm All here right. with Dr. Peter Gray. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to let people know that your work has been really important to me, especially allowing me, you know, giving me permission to allow kids to play and know that it's not just permission because it's a, it's a fun thing to do, but it's more like a roadmap for best learning. Um, and I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about how you came to that conclusion on your own. I mean, as a professor at a esteemed university, uh, how did you come to the determination that maybe the, the legacy system of schools isn't so great after all? Yeah, there's actually a number of routes to that. I, you know, first of all, I should I should say that it's interesting that we live in an era where we talk about allowing kids to play or working play into the child's schedule. I mean, play should be the oh. default activity of children. It is the default activity. It it's is, what children right. basically do. It's what they've done throughout human history. It's uh, play is nature's way of uh, helping children grow up in a joyful way. Play is how children practice all kinds of skills. It's how they learn to take initiative. It's how they learn to solve their own problems. It's basically how they learn to become adults um, when they're playing away from adults and having to be the ones who take responsibility for what they're doing. So just as that, as a little bit of context first, you know, after looking into play for a long time, looking at the history of of humanity in relation to play. Um, so how it, how it became uh, a topic of a focus of my own research, there's, there's a number of routes to it and probably the most direct route was um, many years ago, my own son was uh, rebelling in school uh, going to a, what was everybody regarded as a fine suburban public school, uh, but he was rebelling from kindergarten on through fourth grade. And with each year, his rebellion became more and more uh, serious and more and more um, a problem for the school. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't know what to do with him. He would just deliberately violate all the rules. And um, he clearly, he, uh, from the beginning, he saw school as prison and um, objected to it all along. He just thought, this is, uh, why should I be made to do all these things? I can already do them, or I could do them in my own way, or this isn't important to me. And the idea that he's in a place where he isn't listened to, where his voice doesn't matter, where he can't make you know, basically what we regard as human rights are completely stripped away. Uh, this was um, this was something he could not tolerate. I'm not exactly sure where he got that from. I always tolerated school. <laughs> I, I may have not have, I was sort of the typical good kid in school and so on and so forth. But at any rate, wherever he got it from, it was, so we found an alternative school called the Sudbury Valley School, where it was really the only school, we looked at various progressive schools, it was really the only school that he was willing to go to. And this is a school where there is no imposed curriculum. There's no testing of children. Um, it was founded many, many years ago, 1968. Uh, so the school at this time had already been in existence for quite a number of years. And um, it admits children from age uh, four on through high school age, but it doesn't segregate children by age. Children play across age and they, and, um, and the school is run democratically, so everybody's got a voice in making the rules. Every student and staff member has one vote. Uh, and um, none of the rules have anything to do with learning. The assumption is that, um, you know, as long as there is opportunities for learning, children will learn. They'll figure out what they need to know and they'll find, and they'll learn it one way or another. And so if you looked at this school, you would see that it, it, if you if you went to visit this school at any time of day, knowing only that it's a school, you would assume that it was on recess. The kids are playing, they're hanging out, they're if they're reading, they're maybe lounging on the couch reading. Um, doesn't look like a textbook that they're reading. They're reading something for fun uh, or out of it, out of their own interest, um, and. Um, and so my son thought, well, this is exactly what a school should be. Um, 
and he was uh, he was uh, you know the sparkle came back to his eyes he became the kid i knew before he started school but a few years older than, than that and um but i was concerned uh and uh i was concerned because it was such a radically different school hmm. It's interesting. I had a little background on this. My mother had started a school somewhat like this, a little school in Vermont many, many years, er, several, quite a number of years earlier. And my youngest what? brother went there. And, what uh, was that called? That was called the New Hampshire, no, the New School. It was called the New School. It was mm. in Plainfield. And um, and I, I think it still might still exist, but it's no longer the same kind of school. It's more like right. a typical progressive school now. But at that time, it was inspired by A.S. Neal's book Summerhill. It was and uh, and so I, I. But I was already away at college at that time. I wasn't all that much involved in it, and I always thought, you know, I'm the. I'm sort of the square one in the family. I'm not the one that uh, pioneers new <laughs> adventures. So I was uh, I was interested in that, but I wasn't necessarily hooked into it the way my mother was and my youngest uh, brothers, my my youngest two brothers were. So um, so I got concerned if well if he goes to the school all the way through and he's not taking any tests and there's no grades and so on and so forth. How's that going to affect his adult life? Is he, for example, if he decides to go into some career that requires college, can he go to college or not? You know, I didn't think of myself as the kind of parent who would push him into college, but I thought I wanted that to be an option for him. Right. And um, or I began to wonder, well, do they all just become artists and, and uh, musicians and uh, live in their parents' basements for the rest of their life while they're trying to make a living? <laughs> you know, and so all these things, which any typical parent might have these kinds of concerns. I think it's the rare parent who would not have concerns like that. But since I'm an academician, my concern led me to want to do research to find out what happens to the graduates. So I ended up doing a study of the graduates at that time. And there are already quite a number of graduates of the school, uh, people who had been there through what would have been their high school years and went on um, to life in one way or another, not to another secondary school. And, um, and what I found was they're doing very well in life. Uh, they seem to have come from a wide variety of backgrounds. They're not necessarily people that so the school system would have thought of as the cream of the crop. Um, some of them, many of them came because they were having problems in school of one sort or another. Others started because their parents believed in it from the beginning. I saw different personalities of people. But pretty much they all seemed to be doing well. There were about 90 graduates by my definition of graduates at that time. We managed to contact something like 90% of those 90 graduates, close to that. And um, what I found is those who wanted to go to college were going on to college, despite not, in, not having done any of what everybody thinks of as what you have to do to go to college, right? right. Uh, people, um, uh, going on into the whole range of careers, there was probably a disproportionate number of musicians and artists. That's that's fine, but uh, there were people in every field. There were people. Uh, there were academicians. There were people in the human services. There were people in, in medical um, realms. There were business people. Although the business people tended to be people who were starting their own business, there I didn't find any middle managers in the group. So that's um, that's the um, that was the, that result opened my eyes. I mean, here here are people who are growing up not doing what essentially everybody in our culture thinks children have to do in order to live a successful adult life, and yet these people were living successful adult lives without do, without doing any of that. And so that got me interested in, well, what uh, apparently by any reasonable definition of education, these people were becoming educated. I, I, I define education as whatever, learning whatever it is you need to know to live a satisfying and meaningful and moral life. And these people were living that kind of a life, even more so in my view than 
most people of that age are. I can't say that for sure. It wasn't a comparative study. It wasn't an experiment, but I can say that they were living very, and by their own definitions, they were. By their own, and almost none of them actually in this that study uh, actually regretted going to such an unusual school, despite their, and maybe in part because of their experiences in adulthood. So then at any rate, then that got me interested. Well, they're becoming educated. How are they becoming educated? And you know, all they're doing is playing and hanging out and talking to one another. And so that got me interested. Well, what are they, what's happening in play and hanging out and talking to one another? And so I had a graduate student at the time, Jay Feldman, who um, wanted to do his dissertation um, based on his doctoral dissertation based on research there. And so he and I together, uh, but mostly him doing the actual observations, um, did an observational study. Uh, he spent hundreds of hours at the school um, over the course of a couple of years observing, um, observing play and interactions. And because we had a belief that age mixing played a crucial role in what happened, in his study, he paid particular attention to interactions where the kids who were interacting with one another were at least four years apart in age. And it turns out a lot of the interactions are of that sort there. So at any rate, that study, um, we could see how in this age mixed environment where children are playing almost, you could see what they're learning in play. <laughs> And especially when it's age mixed, not only when it's age mixed, but especially when it's age mixed. The, the person who started this school, Daniel Greenberg, has always claimed that age mixing is the key ingredient as to why this works. Now, of course, throughout history, play was always age mixed. We never segregated children by age. To some degree, it's, it's quite likely that very often your best friends are people similar to you in age. But when you're playing in the neighborhood, when hunter-gatherer kids are playing in the band, there aren't even enough kids that you could only just play with kids your own age. You're always, you know, play evolved under conditions where it's all, almost always age mix. So the natural way of playing is playing where there's a bunch of kids of different ages. So one of the things we observed is that when, it, when the kids are playing in different ages, the older kids are always scaffolding the younger kids up to a higher level of play in one way or another. And that means that they're teaching the younger kids something, not, not because they're trying to educate them, not because they care about teaching, but because to play the game, you've got to show these younger kids how to do it. <laughs> If you're playing in, in this day and age, if you're playing a computer game and there's words on the screen and some of the kids can't read, you got to point out the words and inadvertently you're kind of teaching them how to read. You're playing a game that involves adding up scores and you get tired of adding up their scores for them. So you show them how to add up scores, you know, you're playing, so, so you're, and you're playing outdoor play and, um, and you're helping the younger kids climb trees or you're playing a ball game and, to make the game more fun, you're helping, you're sort of scaffolding the younger kids into the game by showing them how to do things better, by pitching very softly to them, by doing things that make it possible for them to participate in a way that they would not be able to participate if they were just playing with kids the same age. So, um, so that was a that was an insight, and then it led me to really look into well, what has been said about play by other scholars in the past? What do we know about play? What do we? Um, and ultimately, I also then began to ask the question: What what about hunter gatherer kids? Um, I had a co a colleague at Boston College who had studied a hunter gatherer group called the FA, and. When I was talking to her about Sudbury Valley, she said, you know, that sounds a lot like the FA. <laughs> and so I got interested in hunter-gatherer groups and did a survey along with another graduate student of um, anthropologists who had lived in hunter-gatherer cultures. And what we learned is that in every one of these cultures, children played all day long from dawn to dusk, the, the, the anthropologist told us. And they played at all the kinds of skills that are important to the culture, not because anybody told them that they had to, but just because that was, that's human nature. That's what kids do when they're free to play. 
And so it's very similar in a different context to what was happening in Sudbury Valley. So that's part of what all led me to an interest in play. And then let me tell you one other thing that led me to an interest in play. Feel free to interrupt me if I'm going too long. No, but, I'm, this is good. So, uh, so here's another event that uh, affected my, uh, my thoughts about play. I, um, my first wife died many years ago and I remarried about 20, almost 20 years ago. And um, acquired a couple of stepchildren who were of school age at that time. And as a sort of bonding experience, uh, we decided to take a trip to the Dominican Republic. Now, we, so we stayed in a resort, but we got off the resort to go into the city because you can't really get much of a sense of what the Dominican Republic is like by being in a resort. So we went into the city and it suddenly struck me there were kids playing, <laughs> playing the way I remembered playing, which I had not seen for years. This was, this was 20 years ago, and even then I hadn't seen for years. <laughs> kids playing out in the street, making up their own game, running around, no adults around, nobody telling them what to do. They're not in uniforms playing under some coach. They're out there really playing, and by my definition of play, by anybody's definition of play. And so I remember explaining to my stepchildren, you know, that's the way we used to play. <laughs> and, um, and, and then it also clicked with me, of course, that's the way children have played throughout history and throughout, you know, th every place, except where children are slaves or, or in, in sweat sh sweatshops or other kinds of child labor, children spend most of their time playing with other kids on their own. That's how children grow up. And so it occurred to me, you know, if play has been declining, has this been documented by anybody? How do, has, that, has somebody documented that? And what are the consequences? What are the psychological consequences of the decline of play? So I began, this was not my own research, but this was digging into other people's research and putting it together. And what I found was it has been documented in various ways by historians. So for, for example, there's, there's one historian, Howard Chudikoff, who wrote a book on the history of play in America, talks about the first half of the 20th century as the golden age of play, children's play in America, because by the beginning of the 20th century, we'd pretty much done away with child labor, at least extensive child labor. We had compulsory schools at that time, but they were not the big deal that, we, that they are today. And we didn't have all these after-school adult organized activities for kids. So kids were once again <laughs> out there playing the way they uh, were in cultures that, where children aren't in, in um, uh, uh, working at, <laughs> in factories and so on and so forth. So we, there was kind of a revival during that period of, of what I today would call normal childhood, uh, which is a lot of time to play and explore with other kids without adult direction. Beginning around 19, uh, mid 1950s or around 1960, Howard Chudikoff for some reason says 1955 was the turning point. Beginning around 1955, we adults in the culture gradually began to take play that freedom away from children. And we took the freedom away not to put them back in factories working, but uh, because we thought we were doing things that were good for them. So we did more and more schooling. Schooling has gradually encompassed more and more hours of children's time, especially if you count homework. Um, it has the school year is actually now five weeks longer than it was when I was a kid. The school day is about an hour longer on average in the US. And moreover, when I was a kid in the 1950s, there was no uh, homework in elementary school. You did not see, there may have been some place, New York City might have had, I don't know, but for the most part, for the most part, you did not see elementary school kids uh, bringing carrying books or workshops back and forth between school. When school was over, school was over. In addition to that, when I was in elementary school, I can't say this, I don't know if this is true for all elementary schools, but the one I went to, all the way to six hour school days, two of those hours were outdoors playing. We had half hour recess in the middle of the morning, half hour recess in the middle of the afternoon and a full hour at lunch, all the way through sixth grade. 
And um, so we were never expected to be in our seats for more than an hour at a time. And even then, I remember sometimes the teacher would say, oh, I can see you're all restless. Why don't you get up and play? And she had play things. There was kind of the expectation that children are designed to play and you have to give them time, whether they understood that it had educative value or not, I don't know, but they believed at least that this was important for children's health, for their mental health, as well as their physical health. You couldn't just sit children down all day and make them do this sedentary work and expect that children are going to be healthy. Well, we gradually over time lost that understanding. <laughs> and, um, and maybe we never had it really as an understanding. And maybe because we never really had it and we began to think, well, more school is really important for children. They need to be studying more. They need to be spending more time. And we began to test children and con got concerned about test scores. Uh, parents got concerned about this. And then simultaneously, we began to move into an era where experts were constantly warning parents about all the dangers out there. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so that the nor what became what was previously normal childhood, if your kid is five years old or older, you would just send him out of the house, get out of the house, get out of my way. You know, that was the normal childhood. Come back when it's dark or come back when when uh, when I call you for dinner. Um, and so the expectation was that children were spending most of their time outdoors. And there were, that, means, that means all the children were outdoors, not all of them, but, most, but there, you could always find children outdoors to play with. That was the world of childhood during that time. Well, we gradually, at some point, it became, you know, because there were one or two cases of uh, atrocities that happened, a child, you know, some terrible thing happened to a child. And that got publicized. And then parents began to be warned that it's unsafe for children to be out there. And then we, um, I remember, I think it was around the 1980s, you began to hear uh, public service announcements. Do you know where your child is now? And the implication is you're a negligent parent if you don't. So partly because of that, um, parents stopped sending their children out to play unless there was some adult guarding them and and there's a lot of research showing that as soon as you have an adult guarding a child that generally interferes with play greatly reduces the opportunity to play Child, parents and other adults almost can't help but intervene in play <laughs> tell you that's not safe or tell you how to do something or or solve the quarrels for you and so on and so forth and they're undermining the basic purpose of play which is to learn how to do all these things yourself so, so that happened uh, and then conveniently around the same time, all these extracurricular activities developed. So parents began to think, well, I can put my child in all these extracurricular activities. They're getting outdoors, they're getting exercise. We can even call that play, but I don't call it play because it's, it's more really like more school. It's something where the kids once again are being told what to do by adults. They're being evaluated, they're being judged, they're being compared with one another. It's not free, it's not f what some people would call free play or what I would just call play because if it's not free, I don't call it play. So that's, that was the history of that time. Now, other research had shown, independently of the research showing this decline in play, other research has documented a gradual but overall huge increase in all sorts of mental disorders of childhood. And it, it's, uh, you know, just as the opportunities for play were sloping down for these decades, depression, anxiety, child suicides were sloping up over, you know, the two slopes coincided, but in different directions. And so I asked the question, well, uh, what, what changes over that history other than the decline in children's freedom might account for this? And so people would give me various thoughts. Well, divorce rate has increased. And then I, and that, so then I asked the question, well, is that related to the divorce rate? No, the divorce rate actually in, peaked in the 1970s, but this did not peak in the 1970s. Moreover, there's, the research suggests there's no more anxiety and depression in children of divorced parents, although there's a temporary anxiety and depression right. and real hurt about that. Right. But in the long run, there's no more evidence of depression and over divorced parents than there is when two parents stay together but hate one another, right? I mean, it's a, right. so th that didn't really account for it. Nothing else seemed to account for it. 
And moreover, it, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, why does, why do we even, is, it, there's kind of a no brainer here. If you take play away from children, are they not going to be depressed? <laughs> you know, what is mm -hmm. life without play for any of us, but especially for children? You know, there's one um, play researcher who died a few years ago, Brian Sutton Smith, who used to argue that, used to claim that the opposite of play is not work, it's depression. And I think that's a good way of putting it. I don't generally say it because they're, the parts of speech don't work for me. <laughs> but I would say that the part, the opposite of play, the taking away play is going to cause depression. That play is, play is what's fun in the world and fun is the opposite of depression, right? I mean, it's, uh, so the, um, so the, uh, so it seemed not like something that you had to prove, but nevertheless, I I I went through a lot. I, I went through all the counter arguments. I looked also at um, at various um, other reasons for thinking that there would be a relationship between the decline of play and the rise of depression. Now it's not just the rise of depression; it's also the rise of anxiety. And again, should we be surprised that anxiety goes up when we increasingly are taking away play, which is generally not competitive. Children's play is generally, even when they're playing pseudo competitive games, it, it doesn't really matter who wins. You know, there are, nobody's judging it. Nobody's, no trophy is on the line. If you're playing a pickup game of baseball, you just, totally different teams the next day. It's not like being on a little league team where you know, there's a trophy on the line, you're being evaluated by the coach, or do you make the team, do you make the traveling team, so on and so forth, you're constantly being judged. And school all this time was becoming increasingly de you know, competitive, more and more testing, institution of honors classes, who can make it into the honors classes. Parents were developing the view that if you don't go to an elite college, your life will be ruined. And so enormous amounts of pressure being put on children that wasn't being put on children to anything right. like that degree earlier. So there's a range of expe new expectations that seems to grow and grow. And then, so of these course, new people, have, people have challenges when their, their skills to, or ostensibly their skills can't meet the expectations. But it's not that they don't have skills is that the range of their ability to show their skills through play uh, are have been limited at the same time as more expectations have been put on them. Yeah. Well, and, and the, and the, the difference is, you know, I think in some sense, it's not even skills that parents mm -hmm. are important. They care about winning, right? It's winning. Achievement it's getting that trophy. It's getting um, in school. I, I know very few people who ask the question, what are my children actually learning in school? <laughs> they ask the question, how is my child performing on the tests in school? And, 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 mm. and educators themselves are, they, don't, they see they're being given these standardized exams they have to give and they see their job as increasing test scores and they've yeah. lost sight of, well, what is it really important for children to be learning? What are the skills that are important in our culture? And so the focus has become come down to on competition, comparing children constantly, who is mm. best. And, um, and that, and any of us that were put in that kind of a situation, any, if you or I were in a job where we're constantly being compared with our workmates on a daily basis, <laughs> you know, who scored higher today, <laughs> you know, like, I think we would very quickly quit that job unless we were absolutely desperate. Um, and, and yet this is what we put children in. And then we wonder why they're so anxious. So that's, um, there was a study a few years ago by the American Psychological Association uh, called stress, they called the study stress in America. And they found that teenagers in school are the most stressed out people in America. And when they asked what the source of their stress was, 83% of them said school. Yeah. So that's um, pretty clear evidence that school is stressing people out. And it's the competitive aspect of it. It's the fact that you're constantly being tested. You're always afraid of failure. And people interpret failure in different ways. I mean, even the A student mm -hmm. feels like they're a failure if they don't if they don't become valedictorian, right? right. Or they, right. you know, so there's this kind of pressure that used to not exist if you were a fairly decent 
student at all, you didn't worry because you, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to pass, <laughs> you know, and that was, and if you were concerned about going to college, I'll do well enough to get into some college. And, and there wasn't such a concern about what kind of college you went on to. So that, so I think that those things have happened. And, and so all of this also has led me to think about all the things that children learn in play, the, the psychological um, uh, resilience that children develop in play. Mm. The, there's one other, one other kind of standard, you know, this evidence about depression and anxiety comes from standardized questionnaires, clinical questionnaires that assess anxiety and depression that have been unchanged over the years. The, um, the, there's another standardized test, which to me is very telling, that assesses what's called internal versus external locus of control. And what has been found is that over, ever since this test was developed, and there's a version of it for school-aged children, ever since this test was developed, the internal locus of control of school-aged children has been going down. And there's independent research showing that having an internal locus of control, the sense that I can control things, that I can some, in some sense have charge of my own fate, um, that that's predictive of good mental health. That if you believe that something terrible can happen anytime and there's nothing I can do about it, that's that's external locus of control. That sets you up for anxiety and depression. Mm. Well, where do children develop an internal locus of control if not in play? That's the only place where they are in control. That's right. almost the definition of play. It's an activity that children are completely in control of. They're free to do it their own way and make up the rules and vary the rules and and they're solving their own problems. So that's where you that's where children develop an internal locus of control. So no wonder you take away play. And children don't develop the sense that I can solve problems, I can take charge of my own life. And, um, and in addition to the taking away play, it's self-producing depression, that sense of, of um, you know, that sense of incompetence, that sense that I can't really solve problems, but the real problems in the real world that might arrive, that adds to the sense of both depression and anxiety. If... Um... I have a few interesting social psychological questions for you, but one is that I have, I sort of have a foot in the school systems, a foot out because I've never been able to, I just couldn't ever justify going all in and working in a school system, which is sad, but I work with a lot of fantastic individuals who will um, espouse a lot of the common sense that you just did about right. play. They'll cite Vygotsky saying a child of play is a head taller than himself. They might even say that uh, helping scaffold play is necessary, yet their actions completely oppose what they their perceived wisdom is. And I, I suppose that educators themselves are a slave to some sort to this sort of system and they can't do what they know is common sense. Why do you think uh, such difficulty breaking out of such a system? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I, um... So the system of education we have uh, is a product of history. It's not a product of any scientific study showing that this is how children best learn. It's not a product of any kind of understanding about, um, about how children learn. It's a product of history. And the school system that we have today really got its start um, a few centuries ago, as early as the 17th century, but beginning in the 18th century, especially uh, during the Protestant uh, Reformation. And at that time, the general understanding was, at least among the Protestants, but generally speaking, the Protestants dominated the world. <laughs> the Protestants at that time believed that um, children are born sinful. And the function of education is to drive the sin out of children. An indoctrination this, center. And right. indoctrination. So there were, there were really, there were actually really three stated purposes of the early Protestant schools. One was to teach reading because by and large, many of the people were illiterate at that time. You're not gonna to learn to read at home if your parents don't read and nobody in your neighborhood reads. So there is some legitimacy for saying, teach reading, although their primary reason for teaching reading, they didn't see another particular reason for teaching reading, was because the Protestants believed everybody needed to be able to read the Bible themselves and get the word of God directly 
themselves from the Bible rather than hear it from a priest as the Catholics might have believed. <laughs> so that was, so teaching reading was part of it. But if you read the literature on it, even more important than that was indoctrination. It's not just important to read the Bible, you've got to believe the Bible. So the lessons were Bible lessons, largely speaking, they were Bible lessons. And you know, in, in the colonies, the US colonies in Massachusetts in particular, the, uh, the early primer was called the Little Bible of New England. And, um, and children's lessons would be little ditties about you know, how if they lie to their parents, they'll burn forever in hell, you know, and all of those kinds of things. It was definitely teaching, it was, all, it was teaching biblical lessons, but particularly teaching fear teaching fear of God, and as part of teaching fear of God, teaching fear of all authority figures, especially male authority figures, and the, and the, the teachers in the classroom were, were largely males. They were masters at that time, right? So, and, and you know, if you the Bible itself is full of, if you, if you talk back to your father, take the child to the gates of the city and they often stoned by the elders. You know, I mean, the terrible advice in the Bible about how to raise children. <laughs> so that was the, but that was the view of child raising at that time. So what education meant was indoctrinating children and driving the sinfulness out of them. It's basically obedience training and indoctrination and obedience training. The schools were designed for that purpose. And they haven't changed in their design. <laughs> the schools, mm. the schools at first, one, you know, once this, once the power of religion declined and the power of the state increased, the states took over these schools without changing the basic design of them. And also that it fit the needs of the states at that time, but there was a new kind of doctrine. Now it was the doctrine of uh, patriotism, the doctrine of nationalism. It was, uh, you know, um, uh, Napoleon loved the idea of school as a place to train soldiers. <laughs> you know, the, mm -hmm. the Germans, the, the uh, <clears throat> Prussia was the leading uh, leader in these early schools. And, the, and once, the, once the state took over them from the Protestant, from Protestant church, the lesson became all about how wonderful the German people is and the German language and how terrible the enemies are all around Germany and so on. And in the colonies, of course, the, there was all kinds of similar doctrine in, uh, about, about the, uh, uh, in some sense, the Protestant doctrine continued to play a big role for a while. So, so there was no immediate ch need to change the format of the schools. Well, once you've got people going to school for two or three generations, everybody thinks, well, that's the way it's got to be. So schools mm -hmm. have changed over time. I no longer see them as primarily focused on obedience training. And most people who go into teaching don't say, I want, I'm going into teaching because I want to indoctrinate children and I want to teach obedience. They're far more likely to say, you know, very nice liberal things like, I want to. I want to promote a love of learning. I want to promote curiosity. I want to promote critical thinking. I want right. to, you know, all these things. But, the but on their terms, right? <laughs> that, that, but the truth of the matter is, schools were never set up to do that, and you right. cannot right. do that the way they set up. You simply cannot do it. And so, therefore, the best meaning teachers are going into this school system thinking they're going to do that. But if they try to do it, well, not everybody's interested in reading. <laughs> not everybody's interested in the stuff that has to be on that test. And yet, you, and yet you're being measured on whether the kids are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You're, being, you're not really allowed to, and also you have to have order in the classroom. You can't have chaos in the classroom. And there's absolutely no way that with 30 kids in the class or even 20 kids in the class, I would say even three kids in the class, I'm just gonna that, say that you're, yeah. that you're going to find that it's possible for everybody to be interested in the same thing at the same time and for right. you to be able to manage that as a classroom. Right. So the only way that you can reform education in the way that children's natural ways of learning and curiosity and critical thinking really do bloom 
is to throw it aside entirely and start from scratch with something else, which is what Sudbury Valley did. But you cannot do that in the public school system. <laughs> it's right. just too, it, it would, it, it's too big a change. It requires everything. Change. First of all, you got to get rid of the whole graded system. You can't have, it doesn't work if you segregate children by age. You have to get rid of the idea that you can measure education. I cannot picture anybody in the school system saying that we're going to be able to, in short, anytime soon, just get rid of the idea. Because as soon as you're measuring education, then you're also putting kids in competition. Then you're also saying, well, this is what you've got to learn. This is what we're measuring. You've got to learn this. Whether you're curious about it or not, whether you're interested in about it or not, whether it's relevant to your life or not, you've got to learn this. <laughs> and so, you, so the truth of the matter is, we no longer, most people no longer say that the purpose of school is obedience training. But the truth of the matter is, is that's what school is, is obedience mm -hmm. training. The only way that you can fail in school is not to do what you're told to do. That's truly true. Unless you're in, in any, anybody can pass if they do what they're told to, what they're told to do. Um, the only way you can pass is to do what you're told to do. The only way you can fail is to not do what you're told to do. And so the, there's no way around it. The real, the real lesson is obedience. Those people like my son who refuse to obey, <laughs> they just, the school system has no way to deal with them. They refuse to obey when they can't see a good reason for doing it, when it doesn't fit what they want to do, when they have no sense of choice about it and have no vote in the question of um, what it is that we're all doing. People like your son are me and people like your son <laughs> are, the, are the people who I work with largely. And I always think about if I could put a GoPro on them for the day or, or whatever, whatever tracking device, it's, <laughs> it's as you say, you bring up two relevant keynotes, one being that there's a hegemony of education that doesn't even allow for the best uh, educators in the school to be educators. And so kids are just doing whatever it is that they're told. It's not experiential. Right. Then they right. go home and there's uh, there are to their parents who are generally, statistically speaking, worried about liability for them. So there's not as much free play at home. So I'm curious about what you think about, on one hand, you said really the solution to the ameliorative process of schooling and the, the uh, detrimental effects it actually is having on a lot of students is to sort of bust open that the entire system. What do you think that would look like practically? And if have you seen, I mean, there's Sudbury is a rejoinder to the school systems. Have you right. seen others like it? Yeah, I, I, there are definitely, there are many schools modeled after Sudbury Valley, but it's still a small number of students. Even if you take all those schools combined, there's also a whole nother network of uh, schools similar to Sudbury Valley called Agile Learning Centers. There's a growing number of, um, there's a growing number of such schools. It's still a small number. Um, a bigger movement is homeschooling. And within homeschooling, there, um, one of the uh, roots, one of the, categories of homeschooling is unschooling, what's called unschooling. It's not a term I like because it tells you what you're not doing and it puts yeah. people going to school on the defensive. But this is a term that's come down. It was coined by John Holt in the early 1970s. And it's hard to get rid of the term because in some sense it's descriptive because what, what, you're, what, the, what homeschoolers are doing is saying, okay, we're officially registered as homeschoolers, but we're not doing school. <laughs> We are, we are allowing our child and facilitating our child in following his or her own interests. And so there, are, there is a growing number. Homeschooling is increasing, has been increasing for decades in the US. Um, and it was up to, before the coronavirus struck, it was up to, uh, according to a Gallup poll, 5% of American school children were being homeschooled. A year later, in August of this past summer, uh, the Gallup poll showed 10% of American school children. So it was a sudden jump. I don't know how many of them will stay with it. Many of them left school because they don't want to do that, that online learning from the school. They're finding that really inconvenient. And they don't want to send their child to a classroom where they might get the virus. So. Uh, so some of them are doing it for that reason, but I'm hearing from a large number of those people who, although it's probably a biased sample of them, 
who are saying, you know, this is working out really well. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think we're going to send our kid back to school. What I'm seeing is my kids is uh, developing curiosity and interest that he or she didn't have before, is doing all kinds of interesting things, is getting more sleep than they were getting before, is mm -hmm. having, you know, um, and and I'm also, some of them were also saying, because they're they're forced to help their children with the online learning, they're getting a better sense than they had before of what those lessons are like. And they're saying, well, why is that so important? <laughs> you know, is that really so important that my child should be sweating over this when my child wants to be doing this other thing that looks to me like my child is learning more by doing that other thing. And so I'm hearing from more and more parents uh, talking about that way. And I think there, I think a fair number of those who've moved to homeschooling are gonna stick with it. Homeschooling already, for almost anybody um, involves a lot more self-directed learning than in school. You've got a lot more time. Even if you're doing the whole school curriculum at home, even for those families, if they're doing exactly the whole school curriculum, they can do it in much less time than it takes during the school day because so much time at school is wasted. <laughs> so much time is standing in line and so much time the teacher is, is explaining things that you don't need to have explained to you and so mm. on and so forth. And that's, and um, and so, uh, and so I've heard from I actually during the we did a survey of how families were adapting to the coronavirus. We did that through a, an organization I'm part of a major survey, and one one of the questions was how much time is it taking you to do the online school at home? And the average was three hours. Yeah. And there were some people who said. I'm uh, one of them in re response to a written question, one of them said, you know, I can, I can do the whole curriculum in two hours and then I can spend the rest of the day really learning. He actually put it that way. <laughs> you know? That's great. Doing That's what great. I want to do, <laughs> doing what I want to do. And so, um, so <laughs> homeschooling, there's a kind of gradation. I mean, some people have a regular rigid curriculum. Some people who are religious have a religious curriculum for it. Uh, but a lot of homeschoolers, and maybe the majority of them, come into the category of sort of relaxed homeschoolers. We have a curriculum. We report that we have a curriculum. And, and I do expect my child to spend a certain amount of time doing some arithmetic and so on and so forth. But we modify it. We flex it. We, uh, you almost can't help if you're a parent to recognize that your child isn't responding to that forced curriculum and so let's do it in a way that makes more sense to my child and so the child ends up having a lot more control even if parents think they're doing school at home they're really giving the kid a lot more control than otherwise and so and now the the, the downside of homeschooling that most people are concerned about and i am too is our children getting a community of other children? Are they getting right. out of the home? Are they getting right. exposed to ideas that are different from their own parents' ideas? And I think that the remedy to that, I think homeschooling works best when the families are connected to the whole community, the child is through various ways, making lots of friends in the community, the child is part of the, whether it's through their parents' friends or through clubs that they belong to, or simply through being part of civic organizations, or they get to know other people. Those are the cases where I think it works best, including unschooling, especially unschooling works best in that situation. But what is happening, and I think to me, this is the key to what's going to ultimately be the revolution, is that more and more homeschoolers recognize the need for their children to have a community of friends and other kids to play with. As more and more people are doing homeschooling, there's more and more, so they call them learning centers, but they could just as well call them play centers <laughs> that are setting up that are a little bit like Sudbury schools. And, um, but they don't have to meet all the requirements of being a school, so it can, can be less expensive to do this. Some of them are parent co-ops. Um, and so you're so the kid can spend their day there. You don't have to have a parent home all day that way. That way, if you've got just a one-parent family, if you've got two parents who need to work, you can still do homeschooling because the kid is spending their time in this setting with other kids where there's a lot of interesting things to do. There may be classes offered, but generally speaking, they're optional or they can be molded in accordance with what the child wants. That's a growing movement. 
And I think that that movement will eventually um, become so large that increasing numbers of people will take their children out of schools. It becomes easier and easier to do it as it becomes more and more acceptable to do it because more and more people, it doesn't seem so abnormal to do it. Uh, and as more and more facilities arise for it. Hmm. My hope is that libraries will become the replacement for schools. Uh, libraries are already moving in that direction. A lot of libraries have maker spaces in them. There are libraries who welcome homeschoolers to hang around, even without adults, where they make this kind of exception. Uh, they've liberalized their policies in that kind of way. It's not all libraries by any means at this point. Also, even libraries, you now a few libraries that have free play at the library, both outside or even inside the library, where they, you know, for certain hours of the day, they say, if you want quiet to read, you have to go to that room, but the rest of the library is for play. Um, so these, I, I would love to see this, 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 these changes continue. And libraries are motivated to do this because they recognize that people don't really need libraries as much as they used to in the past, just as places to store books. We've all got our books on our devices now. So, you know, we don't really need so much to go to. And, and right, books, are yeah. cheap. books are relatively cheaper to buy than they ever used to be. So that's, um, so, so libraries recognize that they're, continued relevance depends on taking on more and more functions. And a lot of libraries are recognizing we can be the place for self-directed learnings, that the, the kind of learning that children need that doesn't occur in school. And it complements what's happening in school, but it also can replace what's happening in school. So that's, that's part of my hope for the future. The other thing that I, at the same time, I'm also involved with an organization called Let Grow, where we are working yes. with schools. The Lenore uh, Skenazy. Lenore Skenazy is, yeah. uh, is the primary initiator of that. And uh, I was helped found it. I'm no longer on the board. Oh, wow. I've stepped down from that. But we're, but we're working with schools to bring more play into schools, real play, age mixed play into schools, helping schools become playgrounds. Um, and working with schools to reduce instead, you know, whenever I talk to school groups, I, I don't try to tell them become like a Sudbury school because I know that's irrational. You can, they can't right. do it. <laughs> right. But what I tell them instead of constant, it, recognize that there are a lot of things that, that are really important for children to learn that they learn outside of school. And, but to do that, they need time. And those things that they learn outside of school, and I think many school, including school administrators, understand this when I explain it to them, and maybe they already understood it. Much of what they learn outside of school, maybe most of what they learn outside of school is actually more important than what they learn in school. They learn how to take control of their own life. They learn how to make friends. They learn how to negotiate with their peers. They, you know, they learn how to solve their own problems. They learn, these are really important skills, none of which can be taught in the classroom. And I think they all recognize that. So how are they, so what role can the school play in that? The role that they can play is to, instead of continuously increase the amount of time children have to spend at school, recognize that time out of school is at least as important, if not more important, so decrease the amount of time they have to spend in school. Mm -hmm. Let's have sh longer summers instead of shorter <laughs> summers. Let's have shorter school days. Let's have less homework instead of more homework. The truth of the matter is there's not going to be any decline in academic learning from all of that because all we're doing with all this stuff we're doing to kids is burning them out. They will be fresher at that school work if they have to do less of it, they'll accomplish more in less time. And I think a lot of people in schools recognize this. <laughs> and there are some schools and with enlightened superintendents that are actually making real movements in that direction. So two questions, considering that your streams of consciousness are so such good answers and you're on the way you're answering questions that I'm about to ask, uh, I'll let me leave you with two questions and you can take them in any order you'd like. One is, um, is there a place, you know, for some of the pedagogy in standard schooling? I mean, is there any of it that's beneficial that if you were going to rearrange it, maybe you'd keep some of it? And the other question is, um, how do you, as per Lenore Skenazy, I think, tackles this, how do you see going about helping parents feel freed up to let their kids play? 
all the while. You mentioned time at home is important. Right. So let's take the, the first one was uh, a place for um, direct. I'll interpret that as a place for sort of direct teaching where the teacher is yeah, in yeah. charge. And I think absolutely there's a place for that. And the place for that is when the child or the adult wants it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you've got somebody who's been um, who's gotten interested in mathematics and they've decided and they've been playing with mathematics. They've been busting around with mathematics and they say, you know, I would really like to study under a real mathematician. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, and so they sign up for a course in whatever kind of math they're interested in. It could be it's math, totally it could be geography, it could be, but it comes from your own interest and you are choosing, the, the person who's skilled to teach that is not somebody who's trained in teaching, but somebody who understands mathematics. <laughs> somebody right. who understands, who you, you wanna, Today, you can do a lot of that online, but there are a lot of people who would say, you know, you can find, you can find the greatest lectures on anything you want. You can find whole courses online. Harvard has all of its courses online, you know, so nobody really has to pay to go to Harvard if they want a Harvard education. Mm -hmm. and so, so you don't need to do it, but a lot of people like the feeling. There, here's a group of people. We're all interested in the same thing. We're meeting regularly, and we've got yeah. this expert that we're listening to. There are people, for example, some of the graduates of Sudbury Valley, when I asked them, well, why did you go to college? A lot of them went because they, they want to go into a career that requires it. But some of them said, you know, I just really thought it would be fun to go to take real courses from real experts uh, who know this stuff. And I found I was happy doing that. And so these are the people who should be in college because they're the ones who decided I want to do this. Some, I think the same thing should apply for high school. The same thing, you know, if, uh, if th these should be optional courses and you don't have to, it doesn't have to be all or none. If ideally, in my view, there would be, so you've got self-directed education. Kids are learning in libraries and kids are learning in, or in, in Sudbury schools or homeschool or whatever. But also there's this school here or maybe it occurs at the library and every once in a while somebody's offering a course uh, and maybe there's a demand for courses. Maybe there's a place you can go and sign up. You know, I if other people are interested, I'd really love a course in bookkeeping or I would really love a course in this or that. Even Sudbury Valley occasionally has courses when a group of kids say they want one. Um, typically there's a group who asks at the time that that they're thinking of applying for college and they have to take the SAT test and they've never studied math. Some of them will ask for a course to help them learn the math that they need that would then allow them to on their own study the athlete SAT prep book. So they'll ask for a course. It'll be very direct teaching by somebody who really understands math. Um, it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take, you know, the, it's usually a few weeks and they learn what they need to know, but they find it valuable to have somebody who really understands it <laughs> explain this stuff to them. I think there's a definite place for that. And it's true in every realm. You know, you fiddled around with the violin or the guitar or the piano. And at some point you say, yeah, but at this point, I would really like to study under a master of this yeah. instrument. <laughs> yeah. And in that sense, that's a negotiation, it sounds like, between the child yes. and the teacher. And if they right. want to get immersed and deeply immersed in a topic, they can, but it's no exactly. forcing. There's nothing wrong with direct teaching. The, what is wrong is coercive teaching, right. forcing people to do things for the educational purposes they don't want to do. It's ineffective because you don't learn it well when you're being forced. You just learn it in whatever way you need to learn it to pass the test. And and it is it more often, or at least as often, turns you off to a subject as it turns you on to a subject. I think that's no better illustrated in the US and probably perhaps through the world than in mathematics. Uh, there's research showing that the, the, uh, the biggest phobia in America is not snake phobia or spider phobia, it's math phobia. <laughs> you ask people <laughs> about, and the great majority of people say that they're afraid of mathematics. How do they become afraid of mathematics? It's because mathematics was terrifying to them in school. And even those who got A's in it recognize that they're, they got A's through a kind of fraud. Um, mm -hmm. The teacher taught them some memorized way to solve the problem. They didn't really understand it. 
Right. And they learned it and in order and they got the right answers on the test, but they recognize they don't really know why they got the right answers. And right. so there's this kind of sense of, oh my God, I'm no good at mathematics. I'm not going to do anything in my life that involves mathematics if I can right. possibly avoid it. <laughs> not the ones who are going to be coming up with general relativity or something like that. They're just right. you know, how to solve an equation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All and right. So can you fi can you fix parents in in five minutes? <laughs> I think with parents, I think it's a difficult problem. I think we tend to blame parents in mm. situations where it's not always the parents' fault, and you know, parents are to some degree victims of all of this. So if you're if, first of all, I hear from many parents who say. I would love to send my kid outdoors. In fact, I do send my kid outdoors. I'd behave like an old, I'll try to behave like an old fashioned mom. I'll send my kid outdoors, get outdoors and play. But the problem is there's nobody else out there to play with. <laughs> and so what kids are not attracted to the great outdoors necessarily. There's some people who think they should be, but I don't think they are particularly, maybe a few, they're primarily attracted to other kids. And so if there are other kids to play outdoors, then they'll go outdoors and play. But if there aren't, they won't. Right. So the solution to that problem comes with somehow creating a situation where there's going to be a bunch of kids regularly, the same kids, because it's important that you have friends that you know that you can play with, like old-fashioned neighborhood play, that they're all outdoors at a particular time, or most of them are. And, and, and how do you create that? Um, there, there are some people who have done it successfully, it's where parents will get together and will say, so, you know, if these certain hours will we'll, uh, allow our kids, if not require our kids to be out there, and, uh, and we'll rotate. One of us will watch to make sure it's safe enough, uh, but we're, we'll try to promote free play. We won't intervene unless we feel we have to. Uh, so that's one route. Um, we, uh, I would love to see, um, I would love to see well, one of the solutions, but it's at this point, not a solution for most people is the creation of what are called adventure playgrounds. Hmm. So adventure playgrounds are playgrounds. They used to, sometimes they're called junk playgrounds. They're like old fashioned dumps. There's a lot of old tires, there's boards, there's, um, they're usually in a natural setting, there's dirt and stones and there's trees. And it's usually fenced in uh, and where, where in Europe and every place that I know of in the United, at least some of the places of adventure playgrounds in the United States that I know of, parents are not allowed in that fenced in area. Only kids are allowed. <laughs> and, but there is a play worker. There's an adult there who is basically like a lifeguard on a, on a, on a uh, ocean beach, who's there in case of a real emergency, not there to tell kids what to do, not there to solve little problems, not there to pick them up, not there to solve you know, quarrels, not there, but simply there and who is kind of trained to determine, to judge what's a real emergency versus what a typical parent might think is an emergency or somebody right. else might. So train not to intervene, train not to be present and he, he, to, to be kind of invisible, but still there. Um, and I think this is a potential solution. It's, it's a new career being a play worker. This would be, this would be a, a way of employing some, some people we need more, this would be job creation, right? So, and, um, and it's, it's really is not all that expensive. If we could have that within something like that with, and the, and the playgrounds are really easy. I mean, it's junk, right? To create, you just need a vacant lot to put it in. And so, um, so it's not very expensive. In theory, we could have that within walking distance of every child. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, and, and, um, and that could really play a big role in helping the problem helping solve the problem. I also think schools themselves can become places to play and that's happening in some of the schools. Um, so, so these problems are solvable, but the will to solve them has to be there. It doesn't come, you know, in the fifties, it came naturally. You just sent your kid outdoors and it happened. That doesn't, it's not so easy now. You've got to take some initiative. You've got to figure out a way for it to happen. Thank you for all of this. And, um, so if people want to learn more about everything that you're talking about, since we did a quick romp through it, how can I direct people to your work and the organizations you're affiliated with? 
Well, uh, of course, I would remiss if I didn't suggest that people read my book, Free to Learn. <laughs> and, book. Uh, yes. and the uh, I, I read a regular blog for Psychology Today. Um, by now, I have pretty close to 200 essays on topics like this. Many uh -huh. of them are really on uh, how to be a trustful parenting on, in our day and age. What are the things you can do? What are the things other people have done? Um, many of them are on um, on how children learn, how children... Uh, just to give you one example, one of my more recent uh, blog posts is uh, based on a survey I did of children who are diagnosed as dyslexic in school. And then the parents take them out of school for homeschooling and the mm. children then learned how to read. And the question to the parents was, how, why, how could they learn how to read when they're out of school, when they couldn't learn in school? So those are the kinds of things that you might find um, on my blog. Very interesting. Peter Gray, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate talking to you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.